let me say first that what I'm saying is not my belief that if you say your affirmations, something magical will happen and the universe will change in, in some non-science way. All right. So I never have made that claim, although often people have put that uh, opinion in my mouth. What I have said is that I've used the technique and I got a certain experience, which I'll be happy to share. And then I tell the story. All right, You can make of it what you will. I have several explanations for why there seems to be what I would call the the appearance of an effect, which, by the way, would be amazing in itself. Of course. If you could give yourself a genuine feeling that you had a superpower, even if it wasn't real, as long as it didn't you know, interfere with your job, nobody thought you were crazy, it would be a cool feeling. So, so even if it's not real in some sense of reality, still worth having, frankly. Mm-hmm. So we'd have. Um, I, I'm going to take as long as I want for this, and you can just cut me off. It's a fun story from beginning to end. I like and long. a lot of people ask this. This is what uh, this is what this format is for. Long form. Yeah, so please go, go for it. Yeah. All right. So I'm in my 20s. I was taking a course in hypnosis to learn how to become a professional hypnotist uh, and get certified. In my class was a woman who was. Uh, also interested in a lot of things that I thought were pretty out there, some new agey stuff. But we became friends, and one day she said, you got to try this thing called affirmations. I read about it in a book, and I don't remember the name of the book, and so I can't tell you here because she couldn't tell me. And she said, it works like this. All you do is you, you pick a goal, and you write it down 15 times a day in some specific sentence form, like, I, Scott Adams, will become an astronaut, for example. And you do that uh, every day, and uh, then it will seem as if the universe just starts spitting up opportunities. And it will look to you like these are coincidences, and whether they are or not is less relevant than the fact that they seem to pop up. So I, of course, being my rational self, you know, at this point, I haven't even decided if hypnosis is a real thing, right? Right. you know, I'm taking the course to find out in part. And so I'm, I'm saying, you know, that seems like a terrible waste of time. There's no science behind that, blah, blah, blah. She convinced me, partly because she was a member of Mensa, uh, that she wasn't dumb. Uh, and, <laughs> Step and one, then, that's good. And then secondly, it didn't cost me anything, right? It was a low investment for something to make her shut up. So I said, all right, I'm going to do this thing. So I picked as my goal um, that I would have an encounter with a woman who was well beyond my buying power, shall we say. Uh, this is pre-Dilbert, so, you know, mm-hmm. post, post-Dilbert, post you get to add a few points to your <laughs> to your attractiveness scale. It's not fair, but that's just the way it works. So so let's say, if you know, if I could modestly say I was a, a, a six, uh, hoping to be a six and a half, you know, and let's say she was a, a nine, just so you get a sense of the, the monumental task I, I set in front of myself. <laughs> Secondly, I didn't know her. She was just somebody who worked in the company in a different department. So I'll shorten the story just to say lucky things happened, and against all odds, my affirmation came true. So I thought to myself, as everybody would in this situation, well, it's not really the affirmation that worked. That would be crazy, right? Because even though it was a whole bunch of ridiculous coincidences that put us in the same place you know, uh, at the same time, I mean, you wouldn't believe the, the number of them, and I, I won't tell them here because they're, they're just too many. But in the end, it was almost like we were fated to meet, all right? Now, I don't believe in that, but it just felt like that. That's the experience. So I said to myself, well, I guess I've misinterpreted this, and really what happened is I'm not a six and a half. Damn it. I must be her level. <laughs> or or, or maybe, maybe I'm a seven and a half, and maybe she's a nine, but she's got you know, poor self-image, so she didn't know it. So maybe that's all that happened, right? So I said, well, I'm going to have to try something else. So I said, all right, I'll try an affirmation of... I'll get rich in the stock market. Now, that's kind of a crazy thing to ask for, especially if you don't even have a stock uh, brokerage account open. And if you don't have any money to invest, I think I was you know, a poor banking uh, person, a banker that was. And so I started doing that affirmation. And after about a week, I literally woke up in the middle of the night, sat straight up in my bed with a thought firmly in my head that I should buy stock in Chrysler. 
<laughs> now, time, I don't remember the year, but if, you know, if you went through the historical records, it was when Chrysler was uh, flirting with completely going out of business. It was, I, I don't know if they were officially bankrupt, but they were, they were, uh, the government had pumped them up, and most observers were saying, you know, this is sort of the, the company that's circling the drain. So it didn't seem like a good idea, and but I tried to open my Schwab account anyway and pursue it just to see. You know, we're still in A/B testing here to see if this is real. But the paperwork got mixed up, and it took weeks to sort it out. I didn't get my account opened, and in the meantime, the stock starts rising. Yeah, I think it went up ten or twenty percent in the time that I wasted trying to open my account. So I thought to myself, "Damn, I, I was kind of right." You know, I mean, I picked a pretty good stock. But, you know, my timing's off, so I guess the affirmation thing wasn't really working. So I didn't buy that stock. If you, if you go back, you'll find out it continued to go up, because it turns out Chrysler did a turnaround. It was one of the great business success stories of all time. I knew nothing about that, except, you know, the headline news, um, before I, th- I came up with this idea. In other words, there was no story I read, no analyst was ahead of it. It just came from nowhere, or so it, or so it seemed. But I, I lost out because I didn't trust it, I guess, right? I didn't buy, and it became kind of the story stock of the year. Right. So I tried it one more time. I said, uh, I think I'll try to uh, you know, buy one more stock, and I did the affirmations. And one day I pick up the newspaper, and I just had this feeling. And I open it up, and there's a uh, – back in the day when a, a company was going public, they would sometimes put a, uh, a big notice in the newspaper. And it was a company called Ask Computer, A-S-K, or Ask Software, I forget. But they were a new tech company back before tech was anything. And I said, hey, I'm going to invest in this company. I just feel it. Put in some money. I think it went up, I don't know, 10% in a week or whatever it was. I thought, woo woo, I'm a genius. I think I invested about $1,000, might have made 100 which was big money for a week of doing nothing. You know, when you're, when you're not making enough money to save money, making $100 for nothing seemed like a big deal. So I'm thinking, man, I am so smart. I sold my stock. And that frickin' stock went to the moon after I sold it. <laughs> and now I've got these three, these three data points, right? And the only thing that stopped me from the two doing very well for me is that I didn't stay with them. So I said, well, it would be dumb if this thing actually has something to it to set another goal that's relatively modest. <laughs> right? right, yeah. So, so there was another thing I did first. Let, let me insert that before I went big. I, I also made a bet with somebody that I would take the, uh, the GMATs, the test you take to get it into a good school for your MBA. Um, because I'd taken them right after I'd finished my four-year degree, and I'd got, I think, the 77th percentile, which is nowhere near enough to get into a school like Berkeley, which, which would make a difference in my career. So I made a bet with somebody who was going to take a prep course. They were going to try to uh, raise their score uh, into the, from the 80s and something perhaps the the 90s uh, in order to get into a good school again like Berkeley. So I made a bet, and I don't know why I made this bet. It was just stupid in retrospect. I bet that I would raise my score from 77th percentile to whatever was her new best score. So I would beat not only her other score, which already beat me by over 10 points, I think, or maybe you know she was in the high 80s, I think. But I thought I would beat her new score, and I wasn't going to take a test preparation course. I was just going to take some you know, practice tests uh, on my own at home. So I did that, but I, I paired it with the affirmation. And then uh, I also visualized, which is part of the process they tell you to do, very specifically what my score would look like on the exact document I knew I would get because I had taken this test before years earlier. And so I would imagine that in that little box where the the cumulative score was, I would see the the number 94. And so I just kept, you know, focusing on 94 because I figured that would be close enough that if I got anywhere in that range, um, you know, then I'm probably going to get into a good school if I want to. So we take the test. I, my every one of my practice tests, I got about the same as the first time I took it, somewhere in the high 70s uh, percentile. I take the test, felt exactly the same as all the practice tests. I didn't feel like I was having a good day or anything. Weeks pass, the test shows up in the mail. I go to the mailbox, I open the mail, and I open that letter, and it's the same same kind of format that I'd visualized, so I knew exactly what it looked like. And I looked down into the little box where for weeks I had been visualizing the number 94. And I looked at it, and the fucking thing said 94. <laughs> All right? This, uh, yeah, this was gonna... after the stock market experience? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm getting my timing mixed up. It was some, in there, somewhere so. roughly in that period, right? So 
I literally sat there in my little uh, mold-covered, literally, apartment in San Francisco in the Haight District. I sat in a chair, and I stared forward for hours. <laughs> and all night long, I would, I would say to myself, I don't think I just saw that. And then I would reach over to my table and pick up the, the little uh, report, and I would look at it again. And I would make sure I was scouring the document and not reading like a date or a, you know, a serial number or something, right? <laughs> and it was right. And I'd put it down, and then I would just repeat that process for hours. And at the end of it, I said, I think I'm going to set my sights higher. And it wasn't long after I decided to start the affirmation, uh, my Scott Adams would become a famous cartoonist. So I mean, it was, there were some years that, that passed in between and then some other affirmations. But that's, that's essentially the, the path I took. So the odds of becoming a uh, famous cartoonist, uh, I think about 2,000 people submit packages to the, the big syndicates, the people who give you the big contract, your big break. Um, uh, they might pick a half dozen of them. Of those half dozen, most of them will not make it after a year or two. So it's uh, very rare. In fact, Dilbert was probably one of the, you know, I think the biggest breakout or one of the biggest in 20 years. The, the two other affirmations that are notable – was um, I said that I would become a number one best-selling author before I'd ever written a book, and I'd never taken a, a class in writing, you know, except a, a one I think a two-day course in business writing, and that was it. And the Dilbert Principle became the number one best-selling book. The next time I used it, because after that, pretty much everything I wanted, I got, you know, right? Because with success, you don't need the affirmation so much because just everything starts uh, being attracted to you automatically, but. There was a period, and I know you're going to ask about this later, where I lost my voice. Right. Couldn't speak for three and a half years. That's the we'll spasmodic talk about that dysphonia, yeah. Yeah, and we'll talk about that later, I think. But uh, that was the, the next time I used affirmations. And the affirmation was, I, Scott Adams, will speak perfectly. Now, I realize I don't speak perfectly, but if, when we get to that story, you'll see that uh, there's more to it. And if, if we were to look at just the the mechanics of these affirmations are you sitting down in the morning and writing down 15 lines kind of like bart simpson on the chalkboard on a piece of paper how exactly were you doing it and then um, how do you expect how do, how do you I personally explain it, explain it? exactly <laughs> yeah i will start by saying well i'll tell you exactly how i did it but then i'll also tell you that i'm positive the exact method doesn't matter i think what matters is the degree of focus and the commitment you have to that focus right because the last affirmation i mentioned was uh, primarily done in my head while driving but uh, co- you know continuously for years you know about three years um, so the way I did it back in those times was I used a you know pencil or a pen and a piece of paper and I wrote uh, the same sentence 15 times uh, once a day I think I mean there would be nothing wrong with doing it twice a day except it's twice as hard so I I don't think there's a reason that you should do it twice a day. I don't know if 15 is magic. I'm sure 10 would get you there. 20 might be better, but I doubt it. I don't think it matters. And by the way, these are the questions everybody asks me all the time. You know, do you save the piece of paper? No. <laughs> right, you don't save the paper. The paper is irrelevant. Um, if you type it, I'm positive you'll get the same result. I don't know if this works. I mean, again, I'm not telling you that affirmations is a thing that actually happens as opposed to a perception that you have. But I'm sure the perception at least would be the same if you were typing it as opposed to writing it. So I think all of the details don't matter. Here's why I think it seems to work. And there are several possibilities for that. One is something uh, I learned long ago, and I forget who coined it, but uh, have you ever heard the phrase reticular activation? I have. Yeah, yeah. So it's basically the idea that it's easy to hear your own name spoken in a crowd, all right? So you, you'll you hear background noise, blah, 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 blah. Tim Ferriss, blah, 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 And you're like, how did I hear that one thing in this whole bunch of crowd noise? So basically your brain is incapable of, of processing everything in its environment or even coming close. So the best it can do is set up these little filters, and the way it sets its filters is by what you pay attention to, right? It's what you spend the most energy on. It's how you focus your memory. That's how you set your filter. 
So your filter is automatically set for your name because that's just you know the thing that <clears throat> matters most to you. But you can use these affirmations, presumably, this is just a hypothesis, to focus your mind and, and your memory on a very specific thing. And that would allow you to notice things in your environment that might have already been there. It's just that your filter was set to ignore and then you just tune it through this memory and repetition trick until it widens a little bit to allow allow some extra stuff in. Now, uh, there's some science to back that. Dr. Richard Wiseman uh, did some studies on luck. And he was trying to find out if people actually have real luck. You know, can they guess the future better than other people? And the answer, as you might guess, and I'm sure the people listening to this podcast are all rationalists and skeptics, and you know that he found nothing, right? Nobody can guess random events better than other people. But he did another test, which I'll shorten here, but the, the idea was that uh, people who expected to be lucky, the people who labeled themselves lucky and looked for luck everywhere, were a little bit better at finding it. In other words, just actually noticing it in the environment. So if your filter is tuned to this thought, hey, I think there's something out there lucky, let me look for it. Where's Waldo? Where's Waldo? Where's There's Waldo. All right. You're going to find a little bit more and more often than the guy who says, there was nothing to look for. I already know everything's going to go wrong. I'll tell you tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to be me going wrong. Bad day, Eeyore. <laughs> right? So that guy's just not looking for anything. Right. So now, now let me give you an anecdote to tie that together. During the time I was telling myself I wanted to be, you know, a cartoonist, how do you do that? Like, you know, where, this was pre-internet. I didn't know where to search for it. I didn't know anybody. Um, I came home and I noticed, all right, I noticed something I'd never seen before. Maybe it had always been there. I don't know. But I noticed a, car, a show, a TV show about how to become a cartoonist. And I wrote to the host of the show and asked him for some advice. He gave it to me, short story, uh, even shorter. Um, that set me on the road to, to know how to you know, buy the book that I needed and, and submit my materials and, and that sort of thing. Now, you could say, well, that was just a coincidence because maybe that show only aired once, and uh, I think it was on public TV, so it actually probably aired lots of times. But um, there might have been other things I would have noticed. You know? It wasn't just that one thing I could have noticed. I might have noticed other things that would have sent me on a different path, but also toward this this thing I'd been focusing on. Right now, the other possibility: um, every rational person in the audience is screaming, you know, at their uh, at their speaker right now, "You idiot!" This is selective memory. Um, what, what's really happening is there are lots of times that you were focusing on things and doing affirmations, and you just you just freaking forgot those times. Right. It's a survivorship bias, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I say absolutely. That's mm-hmm. completely possible. All right. But I just told you my story, and I can tell you that I don't have a memory in all of those years of trying it when it didn't work. I do have plenty of memories of when it hadn't worked. Yet, <laughs> like I said, the the voice problem took years, um, and yeah, I suppose if I were uh, doing one in particular right now, uh, that I could say it hadn't happened yet. So, so there's that, um, but there's also just the fact that um, it may be a self identification thing, and what I mean by that is. Uh, I, I have a view that we're mostly moist robots in the sense that, um, you know, the, the environment uh, is programming us and, you know, we've got a little DNA that's like our operating system. But basically, you know, you start with that and it can't vary a lot, right? Your DNA is a little bit, a little bit of a, a window of how much your, you know, your nature can change. But that's like a computer, right? And then the environment uh, programs it within its parameters. So you got that going on. So you got a, a person who's who's getting you know programmed by their environment, but they don't know that, right? They think they're making decisions and using their free will. So it could be that all that's happening is that a person who is willing to write down their goal 15 times a day has in their dis- at their disposal, without necessarily knowing it, a, a subconscious that is totally on their side. In other words, there's something in the subconscious that is overriding the conscious and saying, you know, Scott, we're going to do this thing. You haven't figured it out yet, all right? But I'm doing the affirmations, doing the affirmations. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting is it's not the affirmations that are making something happen. This thing is going to happen because my subconscious already decided that I have these objectives, I have these goals, and I'm going to chew through a freaking wall to make these happen, right? And I have some capability, so I can, I can chew. You know, I'm a good chewer. So maybe all this happening 
is that a person like me who has a subconscious that's guiding him toward this very specific outcome is also the same person who's willing to write it down 15 times. Right. So in other words, the causation is exactly backwards from how it looks. Right. Uh, I'm already that person who's going to make this happen. And I'm also, by coincidence, a person who's so intent on it that I'll try anything. And one of those things just happens to be writing stuff down 15 times. 